policy never moves in a straight line. And what you should look at is the role of businesses in your region and their transition. Only 30% of the UAE's GDP is oil and gas. You've had five extinctions in mankind history. Four have been caused by climate change. Welcome to Masters of Change. Today, I sit down with Salal Hassan, the CEO of Ahia, software provider that combines artificial intelligence to help companies tackle climate change. So let's dive straight in. I'm eager to learn more about your entrepreneurial journey uh, and to understand what led to you founding Ahia. Every entrepreneurial journey starts off with um, passion, zeal, and impetus, and, 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 and then some, some hard lessons in life. Um, my entrepreneurial journey in particular um, started off when I was really young. I was really passionate about, about climate change. Um, and I was an academically, I'm a chemical engineer, and I was an ExxonMobil scholar. So I researched capturing carbon dioxide in college and converting it to graphene. Um, by a supercritical fluid technology at that time. But this was all pre-Paris uh, Agreement, um, which, is, uh, you know, the, the, which is very important, and, and there's a lot of context around that. Um, but, but this was all pre-Paris Agreement, so, my, um, so, so I went down a career in investment banking. Um, I worked at the World Bank, at Dubai International Capital, and then at family offices across this region, and I became a venture capitalist. Um, however, that all changed at the advent of, like I said, the Paris Agreement, which speaks about the principle of common but differentiated responsibilities in light of different national circumstances. So I left a, uh, a venture career um, when I got a chance to meet um, His Excellency John Kerry, um, who's a U.S. Special Envoy. And I'd been writing this thesis because it had been bothering me that how, what am I going to tell my kids in the future generations? Um, an investor, you know, in, in, in technology startups was just not cutting it for me, to be very honest. Um, and I saw this as being an existential problem and the largest problem for our generation. Thinking about how I can build software to incentivize a behavioral change. And um, that's where, you know, I went and asked him the same question that was coming through my mind, which was that, is it just going to be the policy direction that will cause this change because the Middle East has benefited so much from oil and gas. Most of the countries that have an economic surplus, like the UAE and Saudi, have it preeminently because of oil and gas. 63% of Saudi's GDP is oil and gas. And the UAE has been diversifying, but that's been the case. So he said, um, my son, policy never moves in a straight line. And I've lobbied for the Paris Agreement, and my successor has come out of the Paris Agreement for a year and a half. Uh, in, the, in the Republican administration. And what um, does, um, you know, give me hope and what you should look at is the role of businesses in your region and their transition. Um, why I say that is because if you're a business from the UAE, Saudi, Pakistan, uh, or Egypt, and you're not doing something on this account, you're not going to be able to drive confidence in your buyers, suppliers, or your investors. Um, so, so that's pivotal. And then I, I left these roles and I saw that in, a, in going from, in our lifetime, an uh, increasing world of, of uh, globalization towards a, um, a world where you have more polarization, um, the only thing that can bring the world together is, is, is climate change. And therefore, um, Aya which means life in all Middle Eastern languages, is a unified uh, platform. Unified coming from the, the, the concept of, of common equity and different responsibilities for all our region's countries. And that's what we're trying to achieve. What do you do at AHIA? So, like you rightly said, AIA is a climate software business. And um, we're building a unified AI-powered platform for scaling climate action across the region. What we have is, in essence, two core enterprise technology products in Aya OS, which is a greenhouse gas emissions operating system, and Tawazun, 
The Wazun is a voluntary carbon marketplace. It's an omni-channel, meaning digital, voluntary carbon marketplace. And all of this is powered um, by artificial intelligence. If we shift and start to look from an angle of technology can help solve a lot of solutions on a wider, more longer term view. Mm -hmm. And if we take the approach of all the technology in the world has been created and is available, what role do you think technology can play in solving or supporting us to tackle climate change? So this is this is a, a very big question, right? What role can technology is if you're if you're speaking about the IT sector play? Well, let's start off with the fundamental basis that right now the IT sector itself accounts for about three to five percent of global emissions. That's a that's a reality. And it can contribute up to 15% of the global reduction. Why is that? Because the top 10 businesses in the world um, are, are technology businesses, right? Because they consume a lot, a lot of energy. So energy efficiency or lack of fossil fuel uh, or using fossil fuels to power these data centers is a big problem. That can be solved by using renewables. Now, when it comes to specific types of technology, and you're sitting in 2023, um, I think the, the, the largest role is, is if whenever you have uh, limitations for data, as we do in, 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 in this region in the form of measurement. Um, so there's a, 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 an easy match. Um, um, it's not, I wouldn't say it's easy, but there's a direct match with, uh, with artificial intelligence. And what, what benefits does, does AI provide or, or machine learning frameworks provide? Um, so they allow you to, um, to be able to detect data anomalies. So data anomaly detection, optimization, analysis, um, predict prediction, um, and then natural language generation um, or generative AI. Um, these are the five core components that can simplify and automate um, a lot of the processes um, that we are, uh, that businesses or enterprises have to do, which is why we're building with, with artificial intelligence at our core. So I think this is really nicely tying into the next question that I wanted to ask. Who are you working with in the region and what's the scale of your operations and what impact have you been able to make to date? Yeah, so um, what our uh, role in, 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 in the region is to facilitate the relationship between enterprises, it can be financial institutions of any sector, enterprises, their regulators, then developers, so... so carbon markets, and then project developers. These are four key spheres what we have to uh, bring together through one uh, platform. Um, what, who we're currently working with revolve around these spheres. So we're working with family businesses, large-scale listed businesses, um, so voluntary markets, and, and the and then regulators. Regulations are still emerging. And so the UAE has been more advanced, um, but then in Saudi, like if to differentiate, the UAE has four key regulatory pillars. They have a climate plan, so on and so forth. So, but they're evolving here in Saudi. They have a voluntary market. So, you know, uh, the largest voluntary market. So we're in discussions or conversations with them how, on how to tackle this problem as well. Then you have businesses with varying degrees and, and variety of issues. There are energy businesses like Aqua Power um, who have a renewable target and need some assistance or facilitation in, 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 in things such as reduction planning or trajectory planning along, along the subject matter. And then there are businesses in developing countries um, who see this as an economic opportunity for FDI. So they have a lot of land and they're near the Nile or Indus rivers. And they're interested in how can we do projects that generate carbon credits that we can maybe give access to the world and we can generate some revenue for our business. Um, so they see this as an economic opportunity. And that include like uh, Nestle, um, Packages Group. Then financial institutions have different problems. Financial institutions, the, the, the core crux is 
Um, so we have a net zero target. How do we take it to the transaction level? How do we take this decision making to our customers? Um, and that's true for advanced economies or, or high tech economies where like the UAE 99% mm. digital penetration, everything is on a, on the click of a button in a mobile app. So here, that's what we, we actually working, got an award from the central bank and the bank of international settlements, um, because we were able to, with our application programming interface was called the IA API, um, we're able to solve the problem of taking climate action to the customer level. And any, uh, to tackle any problem, you need a lot of different stakeholders to come together because that's where the efforts made start to really combine, mm -hmm. uh, compound. So you publish these issue briefings and I want to read a quick brief from the issue uh, specific to the climate change recommendations for United Arab Emirates. Uh, UAE's median temperature has risen above the global average, approximating to 1.8 Celsius since 1900. The country is vulnerable to climate impact due to its low-laying coastal areas, susceptibility to desertification and drought, as well as food insecurity. Consequences from physical climate risk will be experienced by the national economy as 85% of population and more than 90% of infrastructure is located in coastal areas. So I think if anyone needed more proof that climate change is impacting and sooner or later is going to have drastic impacts, it's there. But what role do you think governments need to be playing and how does regional governments compare to other parts of the world? As you previously mentioned, different countries have different problems. As four key pillars. One is renewable energy. Second is your energy um, intensity. Third is your uh, hydrogen fuel. And fourth is mobility. So amongst all these four key pillars, the UAE is a leader. They want to reduce it by 2030 to 0 0.1. This would be lower than the United States. It, it's currently also lower than the US. Wow. So there's a big myth if you don't really dive into the numbers and see that you're talking about the economy that is diversified the most. And the issue here is of emissions per capita. So that's been worked on. Saudi... Um, has, is a very different economy because UAE is much smaller in terms of population and, and, and uh, uh, size. The Saudi has a much larger population, but what they've done is they went top down and put it as the first pillar of Vision 2030. So environment and sustainability is, is the third paragraph of, of the first pillar of Vision 2030. What they have done is that they then created the Saudi and Middle East Green Initiative, which looks at reducing emissions, greening Saudi Arabia, and protecting land and sea as their three key pillars. And you see that trickle-down effect across everything. They've launched the first and the largest voluntary market called the, the VCM in Saudi Arabia. They have 18 of their largest businesses, their largest enterprise participating in that voluntary market. And it's been an excellent initiative. For Pakistan and Egypt, it's a, it's a different uh, thesis. So Egypt has a 26% um, reduction target. And Pakistan has a 50% reduction target, of which 15% they want to do through their own means. And for 35%, they want to do with international support. The key things for Egypt and Pakistan are that they are... They can generate a lot of nature-based sequestration projects because they're fertile, have a lot of land, but they're also extremely impacted in the top 10 countries most impacted by climate change globally because of the large populations and them lying all close to um, the, the rivers. Mm -hmm. And then their economy mainly being, being driven by exports, not of, of textiles. 
So the textile sectors are exporters to the European Union. In the European Union, there's already regulations. And they can't keep buying from Egypt and Pakistani suppliers unless they are doing the same thing, which is reporting and reducing their emissions. Otherwise, the Europeans will have to pay taxes. So that is, in, in I, I hope what I've been able to clarify is the need for a unified platform because the Saudi and Emirates can require projects and developers because they need to reduce in absolute terms. Egypt and Pakistan need help and support, but also need to report and reduce. And what technology does is is, is bring all of this with, with transparency. The series is titled Masters of Change. What is the next change you see coming and how are you plan, it, plan to surf it? Um, so Masters of Change and and is 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 for me a, a great a great thought awakening um, uh, you know name and what what for us the the next change that has already come is a behavioral change that in in how the our region addresses climate change um, and this is an existential problem and Let me speak about the ground realities a bit of this problem so it's palpable for those that are not in industry or private sector, but for the common person like, like us. You've had five extinctions in, in mankind history. Four have been caused by climate change. One through a, the KT, um, uh, the KT extinction was through a meteor hitting Earth, which was when the dinosaurs, the Jurassic and Triassic age, ended and, and completely wiped out about 80, 90% of, of life on Earth. I think that, you know, there's no, there shouldn't be any debate about this, that is it a reality or is it not a reality anymore, that, that like you were saying, dilutes the importance. We must limit global temperatures to below 2 degrees, ideally 1.5 degrees Celsius in line with the Paris Agreement. We must see this as an economic opportunity and we must embed this to in, uh, to, into each and every aspect of our daily lives in order to impact our future generations. If we, if we don't, then we'll have a sense of regret that won't be palpable. And I think our leaders are clear. So for us, the change is... is is now to, to make it our own duty, to make it our companies and, and our places of work's duty, all to start thinking with, a, with this lens. It's been such a pleasure to have you on the show. Hope this episode provides you valuable insights that will empower you to master the growth of your business. Visit entrepreneur.com for your daily dose of business news and expert advice. You will find this and all future episodes on Entrepreneur TV. We're dedicated to making the show valuable to you. So please don't hesitate to contact me to share your feedback, future guest suggestions, as well as discuss sponsorship opportunities. Stay tuned for the next episode. Until then, keep innovating, keep pushing boundaries.